those people react quite differently. Remember a user just wants access to his or her data. And so when, if that person walks in and the computer is encrypted with ransomware, that user might take what looks to be very crazy actions. They might unplug the computer. They might, I don't know, throw it against the wall. They might um, pay the money even because they just want their data back. That's a very different decision than a cybersecurity defender would do. And in cybersecurity, I often compare us sort of to firefighters. Ransomware is a fire and we just wanna put it out. We just wanna make sure that fire doesn't burn down any more computers, destroy any more files, and then probably make sure that we patch however it got in in the first place, whether that was phishing or zero days or however it might be to make sure the ransomware doesn't come back. But we, we the defenders, feel that loss very concretely. The leadership of a company, they want zero ransomware. They want ransomware to never occur on their network. And they might make very extreme decisions like, you know what, users are, we're not going to even give them email anymore. Too many ransomware attacks came in by email, or we're going to read all of their email um, and make sure they don't, they can't open attachments or they can't send links. Um, because the goal of the leadership is the integrity of the business. And so they might go to extreme measures. All of those people are not, again, acting in the perfectly rational way that a, a philosopher would say, which is the philosopher would say, what is the value of the things we're trying to protect? And then how much money or time or energy should we spend on security? That is a balance with the value. We shouldn't, for example, spend a million dollars to protect a network that's only worth $10,000. It's, it's an irrational choice. And we all make irrational choices, um, but we can think a little bit differently about how to be more like that, that rational individual. So philosophers for thousands of years, back to Aristotle, have understood humans think about the world in at least two different ways. Amos Tversky and Danny Kahneman sort of brought this to the popular press in books like Thinking Fast and Slow and the research that led to the Nobel Prize that Danny won in economics. Um, he, the two of them distinguished this kind of mental thinking into what they called system one and system two thinking. Where system one is your brain making very fast automatic decisions and system two being the sort of deliberate, slow, uh, conscious thought about a problem. We need both of these in our everyday lives. Um, if we did everything slow, our lives would grind to a halt. If we had to think about how to operate our vehicle when we drove to school or work today, uh, that wouldn't be very efficient. <laughs> we need these shortcuts. And those shortcuts have come to be known as heuristics. So a heuristic um, is a mental shortcut. It helps us do a fast automatic thinking process using some bit of experience or knowledge, um, mostly to help us out. And many people think that heuristics are good. There are a few people who have started to uncover the dangers of heuristics, and those dangers are called cognitive biases. If you look up cognitive bias on Wikipedia, you'll probably find, I don't know, a hundred of them that have been studied uh, by psychologists and other researchers that are very distinct from the rest. So, for example, confirmation bias is one we see even in research. Confirmation bias is looking at all of the data in front of you, but only sort of using the data that you like because it is it helps support the outcome that you want. You're looking for confirmation of something and ignoring all of the other evidence um, or discounting it because it, you don't like it, because it doesn't help your case. That's an example of confirmation bias that shows up in research. Um, lots of these occur in our everyday lives. There is no cure for bias. It is just a fact of life. Um, we at least at NSA, spend a lot of time training people about bias. Because when we do promotions and when we select people for boards and when we even make decisions about cybersecurity, the decision-making, the judgments that we make can be impacted by these biases in a negative way. 
And so you probably think about gender bias and age bias and those kinds of things, which are also very important. Um, but so too are these ones that affect our behavior every day. So the one that we're gonna focus on in more depth today is action bias. Action bias has been studied quite a bit in settings outside of cybersecurity from surgeons to sports professionals. About 15 years ago, there was a great article uh, in the New York Times that summarized a research paper about professional soccer goalies, just like this picture. And what they wanted to measure was, how does the goalie make a decision about how to block a penalty kick? And in penalties, it's one attacker and one defender with a very split second decision about how to prevent that goal if you're the goalie. And in general, a goalie can protect about one in six penalties. Not great. They have a split second. They often will jump to one side or the other in the hopes that they guess the way that the ball might go. What the researchers found out is the goalies could block about one in three if they didn't move. If they stayed in the center of the goal, um, statistically, they would stop more goals. And when this got pointed out, nobody followed the advice. <laughs> Not surprising. Um, the goalie feels like they want to do something and standing there feels like ignoring that impulse. The fans watching the game want the goalie to do something and standing in the goal, even if it blocks more shots, feels wrong. It looks wrong. Um, but that deliberate decision to stand in the middle of the goal actually would have better outcomes. And so this article is sort of pointing out that cognitive dissonance that happens in, in soccer goalkeeping. Now you're probably already thinking, how does that apply in cybersecurity? Um, and actually, the more you look at it, the more it happens a lot. And action bias is this desire to get some control over an, a situation that feels like it is out of control. And so when a bad thing happens, when a fire occurs in any sense, whether it's a building or a computer, there's this impulse, this human gut instinct to want to gain control over that situation and get rid of the problem. So for one example, think about phishing. A phishing attack is literally trying to get a user to make these quick, impulsive, very fast decisions without thinking. And the way that we train users to avoid phishing is to tell them, slow down, stop and think about this. Look at the red flags. Is that really an attachment you expected? Or is that really a link that goes to a legitimate place? The attacker is playing that the user won't do that, that it will feel like um, an out of control situation. I, I'm losing access to my Netflix account, or um, I've been billed a thousand dollars for something I didn't buy and I must take some immediate action. And in the fish case of phishing, it leads to a bad outcome. But this happens all of the time. Uh, it happens in ransomware attacks. It happens in supply chain attacks. Whenever we're, we encounter these situations where a bad thing is happening, this human instinct kicks in to want to just do something right away. At this point, you might be saying, um, Josiah, are you just saying that we should do nothing when the house is burning down? And that is not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that you should always just stop and watch the house burn down. There are plenty of good cases where you need to triage. You need to stop the fire right now. Um, data is being lost in a data breach or um, machines are being encrypted second by second. No, don't just watch that bad thing happen. That's the wrong answer. What I am going to advocate for is more preparation, having a plan for what you're going to do so that you're not having to decide in the middle of the fire, what do we do? Where do we go? How do we put the fire out? Because the decisions we make during the crisis turn out to be suboptimal. So having a plan, practicing the plan, and then knowing when the emergency comes, what should we be doing about it will save a lot of um, a lot of trouble in the heat of the moment. If I take this a little bit further, I believe two of at least at least two of the most dangerous words in cybersecurity are never again. 
And I have heard these words from corporate leaders, and this is a desire to get rid of a problem 100%. And it le it's a recipe for both wrong and wasteful actions. It presumes that we can make problems go away. And in cybersecurity, I think that is just untrue. I do not, I do not think we can get cyber risk to 0%. All of cybersecurity is about managing risk. And there's lots of things we can do to lower our risk. We can never legitimately say, you know what? We, we will never have another insider threat. We will never have another ransomware attack. That sets an impossible goal. And it's particularly hard for people in cybersecurity because it means you're striving for something you can never achieve. And maybe it's a fine motivating uh, phrase, but it sets an impossible precedent that I really, really think is, is very dangerous. We need different metrics, right? We need metrics to know how are we doing now versus yesterday? Is, this, is our security better or worse than it was yesterday? And that is something, as far as I know, nobody has solved. We don't know how to do it at NSA. Um, we strive every day to do good security and to lower the risk um, as much as we know how to do. But I would love for more people to be thinking about the right metrics of success. So let's talk a little bit about countermeasures. If this problem exists, if people are making crazy choices in the heat of a crisis, what should they be doing differently? There are some things they probably shouldn't do. Uh, in most cybersecurity incidents, the wrong answer is usually pulling the plug. Disconnecting the computer feels like a way to gain control over something that's going wrong. It is almost never the right answer. And I have to tell this to corporate leaders all the time, um, which is the reason that we put it into this talk. What instead should they be doing? And let me give you four different areas. One is that risk management is a well understood discipline and it is practiced in lots of businesses. And this is risk not only to computers, but um, risk from employees and risk from natural disasters. A formal risk management program should reduce action bias if it is used as intended. If the risk management process is something that you do as a compliance check one time every year, that probably is not good enough. Cyber changes much too often for that to be an effective mechanism. But it is important if, a, if an organization doesn't have a risk management plan to say, you know what, what is the value of all the stuff that we're trying to protect? On the UMBC campus, what are the servers worth? Uh, what is the information, the intellectual property worth? Because that's how you make a rational choice about security. Again, we don't wanna spend 10 times as much on security as whatever the, the items are we're trying to protect. That falls into risk management. Culture change is another one. I, I think what I'm suggesting doesn't happen overnight and it takes a lot of continual practice. We certainly need proactive training. We need to help people understand what is action bias. We can't ever hope to manage it if people don't even know what it is and that it occurs. But this doesn't change overnight. They need to be, they need to practice it like you do fire drills in order to build those habits. And so the culture change is an important part that we often forget in cybersecurity. We think we can just hand users solutions, whether it's a tool or a process, and instantaneously it will make things better. Um, culture change takes some time. Another one is leadership education. And this is, in a company about educating the board of directors and the stakeholders, just like the fans in a soccer game to say, sometimes watchful waiting is a deliberate choice. And the shareholders of a company want immediate action. After a data breach of a, of a financial company, people are going to be pretty unhappy if it looks like the company is doing nothing. But sometimes they are doing the correct thing in the moment but it takes some education of that leadership and of the stakeholders. And, and so helping them understand what's going on is, is more valuable than just security theater of, we're going to just take some immediate actions that are not the optimal choice. The last and maybe most important thing is what I call slowing down, but I don't mean slowing down 
while the fire is going on, not as the crisis is unfolding. When we talk to athletes, for example, the athletes talk about how sometimes it seems like the, the game moves in slow motion. And obviously they don't mean that the, the, the puck is moving slowly on the ice. What they're referring to is I've done so much rehearsal, so much practice that I can anticipate things that are going to happen while they are occurring in the middle of, of a high stress situation. And so it feels like the game is slow because I am so well prepared. And slowing down in cybersecurity, I think, is more about preparation. Um, part of this is having plans. And lots of cyber mature cybersecurity organizations have playbooks. They literally have written out on a piece of paper, when we have malware, this is what we're going to do. If we get a ransomware attack, this is what we're going to do. That is slowing down by being more prepared. The trouble is we can't just put those playbooks on a shelf and expect them to work all the time. We actually need to practice them. And that's where, where a lot of organizations fall down. They have at one time thought quite well about cybersecurity events, but then they're not in the routine and in the habit and those plans get old and stale and they don't work in the heat of the moment. So doing exercises, some people do them sitting at a table, um, companies like Netflix have the chaos monkey, if you've heard of this, where they actually turn off randomly computers in their network to make sure the network is robust and that things are as resilient as they need them to be. And so they practice it in real life every day. And that is another way that, that, that can work for some organizations. A another thing that we can do in addition to this is something called a pre-mortem. And this phrase came up in other literature outside of cybersecurity quite some time ago. A post-mortem would be after something happens, doing a reflection, a sort of after action on what went wrong and how can we fix what, what bad thing happens in the crisis that we had. Pre-mortem is the complement to that, which is before a bad thing happens, imagine that it went wrong and ask yourself what caused it to go what caused it to that, that it might go wrong in the future so if we sit at the table and say let's imagine that our university got shut down with ransomware what might have led to that what are the contributing factors and what can we do now before it actually happens um, to make sure that it doesn't happen in the future in healthcare they do this quite a bit and they will use checklists and they will develop procedures that allow them to be proactive and not just wait for bad cybersecurity events to happen. I think that's a great idea in cybersecurity and one that I actually see almost never done, very seldom. The last thing that I'll say is I found that I, somebody told me a great quote from President Eisenhower, which was, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. And I really like that. The way that I interpret that in cybersecurity is, even if you have written down a plan for ransomware in your environment, the actual plan is not as valuable as the fact that you took the time to get people in a room and think about the problem, because it's very likely that a real scenario won't follow exactly the recipe on the piece of paper. And that is okay. You have at least done the process of planning and you've given some early forethought to what could we do and who do we need to talk to and who can make these decisions, that is still incredibly valuable. Um, Sully Sullenberger, who landed the airplane in the Hudson River, um, encountered a situation that there was no playbook for. It had never even been conceived that this could happen. And he still landed that plane and saved every person on board. And he did that because he was an expert in his craft. He had, been do, he had been flying planes for decades and decades. He could make informed decisions that looked like very quick um, system one decisions that were actually the right thing to do. This was not a case of action bias. This was a case of slow preparation long before that crisis ever occurred. And so the plan in the book didn't help him on that day but the planning was a thing for him, making sure he saved all those humans on board.
So I'd like to throw out a couple of research ideas that sort of go along with this for action bias. I'm, I'm sure there's plenty more. One idea is how do we help people in the heat of a moment to validate threats? And that could be on an individual level, like, is this email real or not real? Is it phishing or not phishing? It could even be for the security operations center at a company. How can they validate is this a threat that I need to take very seriously or not? That kind of prioritization. Um, there's no series sort of skill that I know of that says, is this a legitimate attack or not? Um, and what would go into that kind of assessment? I think that's an outstanding, uh, an unsolved problem. Another is how to simplify this deep thought that we often need to help understand a crisis as it's occurring. Um, there's lots of potential ways to do that, to get people to slow down. I heard one at a conference about a year ago called deliberate friction, which was when the user needs to make a, a security critical decision on their computer, don't make it so easy for them. There's a lot of people in cybersecurity working on usable security, which I love, I'm a proponent of that. But sometimes if it's too easy to make a fast decision, they'll make the wrong one. And so when they need to, when a user needs to go to a potentially malicious web page or open a potentially malicious attachment in email, what if we could say, you know what, you have to count to 10 before you can click that link. Um, what are these other ideas to make that deep thought more routine when it needs to be, as opposed to just a reflexive I always click the blue button, uh, even if it's the wrong thing to do. This goes a little bit along with a field of, of in psychology called mental models, which is how do humans, how do people, users, developers understand what's happening inside of a complex system? If you're not a car person, you still have some idea in your brain for how does your car work? How does it move along the road? Um, your mental model might be completely accurate, and maybe it's not, maybe it's, I think this car works like Flintstone and there's mice running underneath the wheels. That's the wrong mental model. Um, but there's lots of research and opportunities for research about how do users understand what happens if I click this link? Like, why, why would that even be dangerous? How possibly could somebody take over my computer just by visiting a website? And for untrained users developing better, better mental models might be a way to counteract action bias. I, again, I don't even know all the ways that that might look, um, but I think it's an opportunity if anybody's looking for an idea. So as I said, Sully Sullenberger, uh, who landed the plane in the Hudson, gave this quote in an interview many years after it occurred and said, a delay is better than a disaster. Taking a little bit of extra time can prevent crashing the plane or making a less than rational decision in the heat of a crisis. That action bias, again, is, is our impulse to get control. And if we go all the way to saying this can never happen, then we start down a really dark path that is avoidable. I think that is the wrong path to take. And so my ultimate goal, my ultimate takeaway for you is we need to help people think about how to slow down a little bit in cybersecurity how to help them create plans and practice those plans, and then to be prepared for the unexpected, um, just like Eisenhower told us. So my takeaways for people at the Black Hat Conference were there are things you can do right now and things that you should put on your agenda to do. Um, I will give them to you just because I gave them to them, which is right away, we can start helping people raise awareness about action bias. Um, I'm really thankful to get to talk to you about it today because now you can spread the word as well. If you have the ability or influence in an organization, have people start looking over the existing plans, the existing standard operating procedures. How current are they? How up to date are they? Um, do they still reflect the reality of the rise in ransomware, for example? And then we all need to think a little bit more about the right goals and metrics for our organizations, which is not zero phishing attacks. <laughs> um, it is how do we set more reasonable appropriate goals? And in the longer term, as I said, we need to work on culture change, but that cannot happen in a week or a month or a year. That takes a long time. 
The other thing that I think is really useful is to help people run exercises. And the more realistic, the better. Doing them at a tabletop is better than nothing, but it's not as good as literally pretending that there has been attack, getting people up out of their chairs and going to talk to their colleagues, touching the real computer that, that is under fake attack. Those table, those, those red team exercises are incredibly helpful for building mental memory and muscle memory both. So that's what I've got for today. I would love to take some questions and have some conversations. Who would like to start? So Dr. Sherman says, from the lens of action bias, what thoughts do you have about the US response to 9-11? Um, there was an immediate crisis. I think people jumped into action like they needed to. We had some experience in terrorism before that, but this was very much unlike that. Um, there has been tons and tons of analysis about how could things be better, and that is, more information sharing and more preparation and, oh, we should actually take various things more seriously than we did before. As a result, I think the nation is more prepared now. I think there's less likely to be um, the same kind of decision making if there was, God forbid, another crisis this afternoon. I think we have learned a lot. In the 20 years since it happened, though, we need to keep up the vigilance and the diligence um, with respect to how likely do we think terrorist attacks are, um, I don't have any inside knowledge about the likelihood of terrorism on an hour to hour basis. Should we do terrorism drills every day? I don't know. When I grew up in Iowa, tornadoes were very common and we did a tornado drill every month. I've never seen people do tornado drills in Maryland because tornadoes are much less rare. I think we should have an appropriate amount of preparation and energy and money devoted to the likelihood of whatever the attack is. There is lots and lots of phishing. There is a very strong likelihood of a phishing attack at UMBC today. And as a result, I think a lot of energy should be paid to those very likely attacks. Um, things like zero days are much less likely than a phishing attack. That doesn't mean that we should ignore zero days or that we should think of ways to help mitigate that risk. But in reality, there are many fewer zero days than configuration errors. And um, if we were to draw a pyramid of threats, zero days are the very tippity top of the pyramid. Other questions? The question is, how does action bias come into play when there are multiple responding organizations? I don't know that it is terribly different, although it is certainly more complicated. The more people and the more sort of outside organizations who have different priorities, um, different response thresholds, being able to prepare for that is most certainly additionally complicated. Um, I don't think it's impossible. I think it still can be done. I think there's no organization on the planet too big to be prepared. <laughs> um, but it does take additional considerations. Do Bayesian models have a role here? I am almost certain. That is an area I haven't um, explored precisely here. But I think they probably do. One, one place that I've been thinking about this um, is in predicting future attacks um, by sort of updating the learning that we know about prior attacks. So the, the likelihood of risk is certainly based on past behavior. People who sell automobile insurance know this. Um, actuarial models are based on real world data and they're updated all the time. The prior learning that we have about which age groups are the most dangerous drivers um, certainly is updated. 
the things that the cyber insurance industry knows are there's much less information to learn from. That is something that they're still trying to figure out. Uh, but it would help us understand risk quite a bit better if we could have a better prediction. To, if, if I could walk into my boss's office and say, you know what, there's a 1% chance of a problem in our office today. That would be an incredibly helpful concrete number to know. I have never seen those kinds of numbers in cybersecurity, actually, other than people trying to understand cyber insurance. And they can put down numbers and say, you know what, on average, businesses with less than a million dollars, the likelihood of a cyber attack is 0.02% today. Um, but probably a lot of opportunity there. How does action bias from the public who may be unaware of its effect often influence an organization's response to an event? How do you navigate convincing the public your slow decision making is correct when action seems necessary? Um, this is a difficult one. Um, education is one opportunity for that, but it doesn't make people feel that much better. Like the soccer goalie sort of example, you can tell the fans, you know what? Sometimes the goalie's not going to move. <laughs> uh, and that is the right reason. And here's scientific evidence to prove it. That won't appease most fans. They will still be angry. Um, and so too will shareholders of a company who, if it looks like you're not responding to a breach. Um, I don't know all of the answers to that. Experience is one, the more that we do it and it turns out okay, uh, is likely to show the value, but uh, that takes a horrendously long time. Concretely, what advice do I have for UMBC students to improve their cyber hygiene? Um, I'm trying not to give you the usual ones. <laughs> um, I think in general, the list of cyber hygiene about like, don't pick the password, password one, two, three, or don't reuse the same password for all sites contributes to this. Um, cyber hygiene is actually an analogy that I like. Uh, I am working on a new book about myths in cybersecurity and analogies is one that I'm I have a very sour view upon, except for cyber hygiene. I think that's a pretty good analogy. Um, and that we need to teach children at a younger age, like they wash their hands to pick strong passwords or. Thankfully, hopefully in the near future to not have the. The need for passwords at all, right? Microsoft is going passwordless. To their benefit other things that you can do as a student to practice good cyber hygiene. Um, one thing that I've learned in 17 years in this field of cybersecurity is that there are these extremes of views of risk. Some people who go into the cybersecurity field eventually say, you know what, the, wor the world is horrible. Like, look how bad cybersecurity is. Um, I have to put on my tinfoil hat and I have to connect my home to a VPN and I'm deleting all of my social media accounts and the world feels horrible. On the other extreme, are people generally not trained in cybersecurity who say, nothing bad's gonna happen to me. I'm too insignificant. Why would a criminal steal my credit card or attack my small business? And so the reality is we need to be more in the middle. And so one piece of advice is, um, I guess to think sort of rationally about threats. How likely is it really that you're going to be the victim of a ransomware attack? It is not 0%, it is not 100%, but the actions that you take about how, how often am I gonna patch the updates on my laptop should be informed by those threats. And learning that sort of threat model is a really useful hygiene skill. Um, and it's an, it is an evolving one, right? We don't teach our two-year-old children the likelihood of you getting sick from not washing your hands is 30%. No, you teach them to wash their hands and eventually uh, they will learn how to make risk decisions for themselves. Should I, put, should I buckle my safety belt when I get into the car? Well, lots of people die from car accidents and I want to lower my risk. And so the cost of buckling my seatbelt is very low. I'm always going to do that. Um, those, that's how I go about thinking about cyber hygiene choices. Like, should I wash my hands? Should I brush my teeth? Should I put on my seatbelt? Um, 
I know that deviated a little bit from concrete advice, things like picking good passwords, um, updating your computer. Th those are the things that have been validated to be the most um, effective in protecting you. Um, there's lots more things you could do if you're willing to spend more money and more time, but sometimes where you might end up doing more than the risk really um, will accomplish. Dr. Bodak says two-factor authentication is an obstacle and wants to get rid of it. That is a fine perspective. Um, there is research that shows that two-factor does make people more secure, but I agree from a usability perspective, it is very cumbersome. And I think that two-factor, we need to work towards that goal of better security in more usable ways. Um, the fact that Microsoft wants to get rid of passwords doesn't mean that there's no authentication. It means they're going to authentication they believe is more robust. Um, some of that is codes on your phone, which are not all that much better than passwords. Some are hardware tokens like YubiKeys, which are much better. Um, so them making that commitment is a really um, good sign, I think, in my opinion. I feel like I've missed some questions because I can't see them all right now. Let's see if I can scroll back up. Ah, what about AI? So do you have any thoughts about using AI as a means to predict and or mitigate action or biases in cybersecurity? Would AI alleviate or complicate the problem? Um, I don't know. It certainly is not the answer today. You cannot buy a product, despite what Darktrace will tell you, that will solve all your problems using AI. Um, I have a lot of hope in machine learning. The place that I see it in use, even at NSA now, is in malware classification. It does a very good job at that. Um, and I see places where machine learning is helping people in other domains. Um, recommender systems, even the ones you use on Netflix and Amazon, where it says, you have watched these movies and read these books. And so um, that is an opportunity that I see in cybersecurity. It might help prevent action bias. In one of my previous jobs, I did some research about um, people like penetration testers. And maybe I've talked about this at CDL before. What I would really like is the human not to have to make critical decisions in the heat of a moment. Even I am doing a red team penetration test and I'm gonna launch an exploit and try and break into this server. A machine, which has no biases other than what the humans build into them, could say, you know what, 90 times out of 100, that doesn't work. And Josiah, you probably shouldn't do that. But if you tried this other thing, it might be more successful. That I feels like a good opportunity. I never built that system, um, but it might be there. The danger always, and this is a common subject in AI, is that humans do build in bias into the algorithms. Um, there's a really good book called um, Weapons of Math Destruction, uh, which is a pretty easy to read book about how algorithms can go wrong um, because humans have coded their human biases into the algorithms. So we certainly need to be careful about that. Great questions. Others. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure again, and we'll reconvene in two weeks. I will put my email address in the chat too, in case anybody wants to follow up at a later time. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. I'm happy to stick around if people have other things they want to talk about, this or anything else. <laughs>